If you have your Bibles this morning, would you turn to John's Gospel, chapter 3? Uh, we have two more messages this week and next week in the Gospel of John. We've been looking at the first three chapters. We begin in chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to conclude the study of these first three chapters again next week. We're going to be looking at John chapter 3, beginning in verse 19 and reading through verse 24. You know, as you're turning there, there are exactly 433 instances in which the word light is referenced in the Bible. In fact, the word light is one of the more frequently used terms in all of Scripture. We find it in the third verse of the entire Bible when God says, let there be light. And we find light in the very last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, where the light of God himself supplants the light of the sun and the moon. And sometimes when the word light is used, it is speaking of physical light. And other times it speaks of a spiritual illumination. And so we have to understand contextually which is referenced each time. But I wanted to just briefly share with you a few verses that speak to light. One I've already mentioned in, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, uh, God said, let there be light. And along with that light came an order, a structure, an awareness. Uh, we think of the time when the people were wandering, as described in the book of Exodus. God led them by a pillar of a cloud by day, but by a pillar of fire at night. When they couldn't see, God himself provided the light so the people would know to follow him. In Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 3, we read of the mandate that God gave the nation of Israel, and that is that the nation would arise and would shine for its light had come, and that nations would come to the light. And then as we turn to the Gospels in John chapter 9 and verse 5 and 6, Jesus calls himself the light of the world. In Matthew chapter 5 verses 14 through 16, as we as Christians are related to God through Jesus Christ, he says, you yourself are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. And then as I referenced earlier, all the way in Revelation chapter 22 in verse 5, we see that God himself in eternity is light. And so in our text this morning, we're going to see how Jesus contrasts living in the light with living in the darkness. And he gives characteristics of each. In verses 19 and 20 of our text, we're going to see what characterizes a life that is in the darkness, in spiritual darkness. And then in verses 21 through 24, we're going to see some of the characteristics of the life that is marked by the light. Look with me, beginning in John 3 and verse 19. This then is the judgment. Jesus is speaking. The light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who practices wicked things hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. After this, Jesus and his disciples went to the Judean countryside where he spent time with them and baptized. John also was baptizing in Enon near Salem because there was plenty of water there. People were coming and being baptized since John had not yet been thrown into prison. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that Jesus is the light of the world. We sang just a few moments ago that first song, The Gospel Light. It's the light that is consistent with life and with truth and with everything that is good and everything that is of you. Lord, your light and in you is no darkness. Yet, Lord, we live in a world where darkness abounds. 
And so, Father, we pray that as we look at this subject matter today, I pray that every person within the sound of my voice would come to the light, would come to Jesus Christ, not resisting him, but believing on him, that, Lord, the light of Jesus might shine through and they would be a witness for you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. For this third consecutive week, we're looking at this dialogue between Jesus and Nicodemus. You're probably familiar with Nicodemus by now, even if you haven't been with us in these past couple of weeks, you probably have an awareness of Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee and Jesus is speaking truth. You must be born again to him. We have seen in these past couple of weeks the need to experience the spiritual birth. Now, as we read this narrative, and this week we're going to uh, leave and depart from uh, this discussion that Jesus has with Nicodemus. Next week we'll be looking at John the Baptist and his ministry. Yet, as we look at this, we see that at this time seeds were being planted by Jesus, the truth of the word. Yet Nicodemus has yet at this point to believe. Now I believe it is not too much of a stretch to say that Nicodemus later bore fruit. Because we read three years after this encounter with Jesus, when Jesus was crucified and was buried, Nicodemus is listed as one of two individuals close enough to Christ who desired that he experience a proper burial. And that should encourage us as we share the gospel with friends, with family, with co-workers. We may not see immediate results, but, but I believe Nicodemus, and it's not too much of a stretch to believe that these seeds that Jesus planted, the truth of the gospel, were bearing fruit in his life. Today, though, we see that Jesus in this discussion is speaking about light and darkness. He speaks about the life that is void of the light, and then he shares characteristics of what it is to live a life in the light. Well, I want you to first look with me at verses 19 and 20, and we see the life that is void of the light. And simply put, that is the life that is in darkness, spiritual darkness. Years ago, uh, it was a Friday evening and I was in bed. It must have been around 11.30 and, and uh, Karen and I received a phone call. Our youngest son was in the emergency room at Lynchburg General Hospital and uh, he had had an accident at a youth group activity and uh, uh, I couldn't sue the youth group because my oldest son, his older brother, was actually the youth minister that was carrying out the event. Well, how did it happen? He broke his nose and rattled a few teeth by the grace of God. Um, it wasn't permanent damage to either, although his nose is a little bit crooked still today. But what happened was this. They were playing a game of chase, of pursuit, in the darkness in a church, and this was a church that my youngest son was not familiar with. And so I said, well, how did it happen? Well, the, uh, you know, the first thing I said is I told you not to run around in the dark. <laughs> I think I did at least. But he said, what happened is he went through this doorway that was leading toward what he thought was steps that were going up and instead, they were steps that were going down. And so he lunged up and got air. He fell down and face planted right on the platform beneath the steps. By the grace of God, he was okay. I wasn't too happy that evening, I'll be honest, with either of my sons. But you know, running in the dark is a dangerous thing because we can't see, we don't have perception, we're not able to observe reality, we don't have guidance, and the same thing is true spiritually. There are people today who are walking out in the daylight, but they're walking in darkness. They're walking in spiritual darkness. They do not understand, they do not perceive spiritually, visually, the things of God. Spiritually speaking, Jesus is the light. 
The person who chooses to live without Jesus as Lord is choosing to walk in the darkness. We saw last week that anyone who does not believe in Jesus Christ is already condemned, not just condemned after one dies, but is in a state right now of condemnation. That is, even as a breathing person at this very moment, if one is not trusted in the light, he or she is in darkness. And the point is this, why risk it? Why risk this? You see, hell is a very real place. It's called a place of eternal condemnation. That's what Matthew 25 and verse 46 tells us. As sure as you're sitting here and I'm standing here, hell is a literal place. It is a place of torment. It is a place of gnashing of teeth. It is a place that is described in many ways in a terrible state, but among the most terrifying and terrible aspects of hell is that it is a place of darkness. One is in torment, as we see in Luke 16, and this suffering is in total darkness. Earlier in Matthew 25 and verse 30, Jesus describes hell as a place of utter darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is a place of regret. It is a place where people say, well, you won't remember. Yes, you will remember. You'll remember opportunities that you had to believe on the Lord yet rejected him. Our ladies have recently concluded a study on Monday evenings in the book of Jude. And it describes in that one chapter in verse 6 that the fallen angels are kept with what? Eternal chains in darkness. But, but it doesn't stop there. In verse 13, it speaks of apostates, those who maybe even though they had heard the word, maybe they had given an external appearance of believing on the word, nonetheless are separated from the light, Jesus Christ. And it says that those people, the blackness of darkness is reserved forever. The person who is not following Jesus Christ is standing in a place of spiritual darkness. And unless that one, unless you receive the light, what follows is a place of eternal darkness. Well, Jesus gives us the attributes of a life in darkness. And the first is this, it is a life separated from Jesus. You know, as we look at hell and we speak of hell being darkness, the reason it is darkness is that Jesus himself is light. Jesus is not there. Thus, it is a place of darkness. In John chapter 9, verse 5, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And here we look in verse 19. It says, this then is the judgment, the judgment that holds one accountable. The light, that is Jesus Christ, is coming to the world. And what? People followed the light? No, these individuals, it said they loved the darkness rather than the light. They they, they loved darkness. Why is that? Because their deeds were evil. Look at verse 20. For everyone who practices wicked things does what? Hates the light, stands against the light, resists the light, and does what? Avoids it. And so uh, the, the life that is in darkness is a life that is separated from the life-giving light who is Jesus Christ. Does that describe you today? I'm not asking, do you go to church? I'm not asking, do you try to do good deeds? I'm asking, have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ unto life? But not only is it a life, the life in darkness, that is a life separated uh, from Jesus, but it is a life that is pulled by sin. Notice it said that one loves the darkness. What are we, the thing that we love, we're gravitated toward. And, and then it says that the one in darkness practices wicked things. And that present tense carries the idea of a continual action. And so the life in darkness is not only a life that is separated from Jesus, but it is a life that gravitates towards sin. Jesus came to destroy sin. Jesus says the light came to remove darkness. Yet the person who is in darkness has rejected the light, has resisted Jesus and loves being in that continual state of darkness. But I want you to see 
Not only is it a life separated from Jesus, a life that is pulled by sin, but it is a fruitless life. It is a futile life. Notice what it says in verse 21. Everyone who practices wicked things hates the the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. We see that purpose clause there, so that his deeds may not be exposed. What it means is the person who lives in darkness doesn't want to be found out. And you say, well, why are you saying that that's a futile life? Because the very thing they're trying to do, they're not accomplishing. You say, well, you don't understand, Pastor. I look on the TV that people are blatantly stealing and people who are blatantly doing wicked things, beating people in the middle of the street. They don't care what people think. That's what we think. But in reality, they think when they do that, there's no accountability. That, that, that they can do it and, and there's no repercussion. They can carry out the deed. They don't have to face up to it. The problem is God knows everything. Proverbs 15, 3 says, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, observing the wicked and the good. So those who have rejected the light think that in the darkness, their deeds will not be exposed. But the scripture says there's coming a day when every deed will be exposed. But here's the fourth thing, and this is going back to last week. The life that is in darkness is a life that is already in the state of condemnation. You can't say, well, I don't know the Lord. I've not chosen the Lord, and I'll just live my life, and when I die, I'll be in darkness. No, the scripture says you're in darkness now, spiritual darkness. You're already in a state of condemnation. It's like if you were to be tried at the point of death now, you would be convicted towards separation from the Lord. But by the grace of God, you're alive now. I don't know about you, but I can see why Nicodemus showed up for Jesus because he saw the light. He came to honor Jesus and the life that is darkened by sin is a hazardous way to live. Well, let's look at life in the light. We've looked at the attributes of life in darkness and no one wants to stay in that state. And if you're in a state of spiritual darkness, I urge you today, Heed the Spirit's call to repent, believe on Jesus Christ. But then look at verses 21 through 24. We see the life in the light. And simply put, life in the light is the Christian life led by the Lord. It is a life in Christ. It is centered in him, not on our own righteousness. Jesus contrasts the Christian's life with the life in darkness. For instance, the the life in darkness wants to avoid the light. The life in darkness thinks it won't be exposed. But we see life in the light is different. First, it is a life of obedience to Jesus. Rather than avoiding the light, as we see those in darkness sought to do in verse 20, it tells us in verse 21 that anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light. Ephesians 5, 8 says, uh, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. In other words, he said, in your former way of life, Ephesians, and we studied that a while back, you were walking in darkness. You were spiritually ignorant. You were spiritually misguided. You were led by the world of darkness, not by the light. But now you're children of the light and walk in a way that's consistent with it. And this life with obedience is to be distinct from the unbelieving life. We as Christians, we're a witness to those around us. If we're involved in the deeds of darkness, then we're not a witness to the Lord. 1 Peter 2.9 says uh, to the believers, you're a chosen race of people who are his possession so that, again, that purpose, you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, how does someone move from darkness to light? You don't just wake up one day and say, I think I'm going to walk spiritually in the light. No, God pulls you there. God is the one who calls you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that life is a life of obedience. Life in the light 
is an obedient life. But not only that, it is a life of public proclamation. The life in the darkness, carrying out the deeds not to be exposed. Think about it. There's a reason we have curfews. Why is that? Because a lot of bad things can happen in the darkness, can happen in secret. And so the unbelieving life, the life that is apart from the life of Christ, is a life that seeks to conceal the wrongdoing. In contrast, the Christian life is a life of public proclamation. Why is that? Let's look at verse 21. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. In other words, we live, why Christians? So that people would see God working in and through us. The Christian life is a life outwardly that proclaims the Lord Jesus Christ who is working in the heart of a believer. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. And do you know one of the first ways and one of the more important ways we can publicly proclaim the light the Lord Jesus Christ is through believer's baptism. I've been baptized. Some of you have been baptized. Believer's baptism. We move from Jesus' direct teaching, and you, if you have a red letter edition, verses 19 through 21 are in the red letter, but we move to a narrative, yet we're still continuing this study in the light because what do we see? We see that Jesus and his disciples, his disciples were baptizing. We see that John the Baptist was baptizing. And you say, how does that uh, correspond to the light? Well, these works, these baptisms of individuals were proclamation of the light. And so when a person is baptized, that person is shining the light of Jesus and says, I believe in him. Baptism doesn't save a person. It's the inward cleansing of the Holy Spirit through the work of Christ that saves a person. It doesn't affect right standing with God. Our salvation is not of any outward work, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians also tells us that. It does not literally wipe away sins. But what does it do? I want to see three things this morning about believer's baptism. It is a sign of entrance into the kingdom of God. It is a sign of entrance into the kingdom of God. It is a one-time sign. It's, it's an initiation. It's the beginning. I heard a famous race car figure. I won't call him because we're online. Uh, but I, I love him. He's a comedian. You, you would know him if I called him out by name. He's retired now. I heard him speak one time. He said, yeah, I've been baptized seven times. It was like he was proud of it. There's nowhere in scripture that you're baptized that many times. It's once. It's a sign of entrance into the kingdom. It's an outward sign, I believe. But not only that, it's an act of obedience. Jesus himself was baptized by John the Baptist. He didn't have sin. Why did he do it? He did it to please the Father. Was an act of obedience. He said in Matthew 3, 15, I'm baptized, I'm being baptized to fulfill all righteousness. But then thirdly, it's this. It is a public profession. It is a conscious decision of a follower of the Lord Jesus to say, I believe, and this is my way of letting you know. And we practice baptism by immersion. The narrative here says that there was baptizing that was happening in verse 23 because there was plenty of water. I'm not going to read too much into the narrative but I will just say we practice baptism by immersion because it pictures the believer of the old life and being raised to walk in a new life. The darkness under to rising up to the life of light above. It is a public profession. You may never preach a message as I do. You may never teach a Sunday school class in front of people but through the act of baptizing, you're proclaiming Jesus Christ. You say, I believe, I believe. I have this wedding ring on. 
It stays on all the time. I realize some of you men and ladies, y'all work in professions where it's hazardous to keep them on. I'd judge you not. Mine doesn't come off for two reasons. One, it's a sign of my love for Karen. Two, she feeds me pretty well. I can't get it off anymore. <laughs> it shows, like that, David. But here's the point. When that's there, what does it say? He's married, in this case, to Karen. All right. This doesn't make me married. I could take it off, and I'm still married. It's a sign. It's an outward sign of marriage. Some people say, well, I don't need to be baptized. That would be like me saying, I don't need to let anybody know that, that I am married to Karen. No, I should be proud. Baptism is a public profession of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important to be baptized. Not that it makes you more right with God. Not that it contributes to your salvation. It is a way of identifying to others. It is a public proclamation to others, I believe. So the Christian life, life in the light is a life of obedience, but it's also a life of public proclamation. Not ashamed of the Lord, not doing deeds in secret, but doing seeds to bring glory to God. And that leads to the third, the light life is this, a life of God-centered ministry. Look again at verse 21. Anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light. So that why? Works may be shown to be accomplished by God. You know what that says? You come to the light so that God can work through you, so that you'll be a conduit, so that you'll be a conduit. I, I read a book a friend of mine wrote, and, and uh, I've known him for about 20 years, and uh, he gave the book at a pastoral gathering in Lynchburg. He said, uh, the book is $10 unless you read it, it's free. So I took it free, so I better read it. But he talked about that very thing. He talked about how God's desire through prayer and through everything is that he work through us. And then who receives the glory? God does. You see, the Christian life is a corporate life. I don't know about you, but there's no more fun than there is in the fellowship of the church, this corporate outward aspect of it. John 1, 7 says, if we're in the light, not only are we forgiven by Jesus Christ, but we have fellowship with one another and we can minister and serve one another. John the Baptist was serving Jesus. We're to minister to one another and we're to minister outside of this body of believers. Elsewhere in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but no, under a lampstand so that all in the house will see. He said, even so, let your light shine. Let your light shine that people may see your works not as being you, but God, and will bring glory to God. Next week, we're going to close our look in these first three chapters of John's gospel by looking more directly at John the Baptist. But we can say this about John the Baptist. He was a light. He was a light. People knew him. In fact, we see here it says that uh, John was baptizing and continuing to do the work, continuing to do the work. Why is that? Because he had not been yet thrown into prison, it tells us in verse 24. So he was serving as long as he had access to water. He, this was his ministry. What was his ministry? Baptism or repentance? Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. And so he's serving, he's serving, he's serving. Then he goes into prison. But I don't believe that his ministry stopped there. John the Baptist served until he died. Are you in the light today? Are you obedient to what God's calling you to do? Have you publicly proclaimed him through the act of baptism? Are you not ashamed of him daily in your life? Are you serving him in the local ministry, even as John the Baptist did? And are you serving him in the community? You see, a light by its nature is meant to shine. 
It's meant to impact others, to have an impact beyond ourselves. The Christian life is to be a life of service to others, that our works may be shown, as it says again in verse 21, to be accomplished by God, that God works in us, that we might glorify him. I wonder today, are you in the light? Are you in the light? Or are you still in darkness, minus the light, Jesus Christ? I call it refrigerator theology. The light in the refrigerator is either on or off. It's never off on, on off. I've shared with the church before, sometimes I try to crack that door open and see when it comes on. But I can promise you this, it's one or the other. And in your life today, you're either standing in a state of darkness without Christ, standing in a state of condemnation, a risky state. Should your life be taken from you today, you would be separated in a place called hell of eternal darkness. Or maybe today you're in the light. I pray that you are. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, is his light being manifested through you? Talk is cheap. Are you living the life that you profess? Do others see a difference? Is your life a life of obedience? Is it one of public proclamation? God-empowered ministry. Maybe this morning you need to follow the Lord and believers' baptism. I was blessed this past week, or actually a little over a week ago, I saw a testimony of a young man that grew up in this church, Frankie Brown. Many of y'all know Frankie. Frankie made a profession of faith, believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and was baptized, and they had it, the baptism, on um, their church website. So I got to see the video of it. He preached about as long as I'm preaching now. I mean, I was so proud of him. And I remember him saying this, tired of playing games. I'm serious about this. And he, he began to look at others. Are you serious about him? If you're serious about him, you should do the same. You see, living life in the light is the best life, but it's a life that must be lived. Let's live it before the world, that they would see our good works. Not to say we're good, but they might see the works of God in and through us, that God would be glorified. Let's pray. Father, as we have looked to your word today, we thank you for Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, who called us the light. And Lord, even as the moon receives its light from the sun, Lord, the only light that we have that is true eternal light is that with Christ working in and through us. Father, if there be any here today who have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that they would realize the gravity of the situation, that right now the state they're in is a state that is separated from you, that is pulled by sin. And Lord, they need to trust in you. Father, there may be some here today who have made that decision in the heart, but have not been proud enough to pub publicly proclaim Jesus through baptism. I pray you would stir their hearts today. Father, there may be others in the light today who are just feeding off the light, but not emanating the light. Uh, feeding off of your goodness and your grace. They've been blessed financially. They've been blessed family-wise, but everything just goes to them and nothing goes out. Father, may people see our good works and glorify you as your light shines through us. Father, speak in this hour, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to give you an opportunity to respond today.